Every year, my birthday cake, my Easter basket, my Christmas candy canes always had to be blue. Yes, my mom agreed. I'll watch for a blue signal, and I'll try to avoid jumping off the palace roofs. She gave me one last hug. I tried not to feel like I was saying goodbye. I shook hands with Paul. Then Nico and I walked out of the kitchen doorway and looked at Miss O'Leary. Sorry, girl, I said. Shadow travel time again. She whimpered and crossed her paws over her snout. Where now? I asked Nico. Los Angeles? No need, he said. There's a closer entrance to the underworld. Chapter 7. My math teacher gives me a lift. We emerged in Central Park just north of the pond. Miss O'Leary looked pretty tired as she limped over to a cluster of boulders. She started sniffing around, and I was afraid that she might mark the territory. But Nico said, It's okay. She just smells the way home. I frowned. Through the rocks? The underworld has two major entrances, Nico said. You know the one in LA? Chiron's Ferry? Nico nodded. Most souls go that way, but there's a smaller path, harder to find. The door to Orpheus. The dude with the harp? The dude with the lyre, Nico corrected. But yeah, him. He used his music to charm the earth to open up a new path into the underworld. He sang his way right into Hades' palace and almost got away with his wife's soul. I remembered the story. Orpheus wasn't supposed to look behind him when he was leading his wife back to the world, but of course he did. It was one of those typical and so they died the end stories that always made us demigods feel warm and fuzzy. So this door to Orpheus, I tried to be impressed, but it still looked like a pile of rocks to me. How does it open? Do we need music? Nico said. How's your singing? Um, no. Can't you just, like, tell it to open? You're the son of Hades and all. He's not so easy. We need music. I was pretty sure if I tried to sing, it would cause an avalanche. I have a better idea. I turned and called, Grover! We waited for a long time. Miss O'Leary curled up and took a nap. I could hear the crickets in the woods and owl hooting. Traffic hummed along Central Park West. Horse hooves clopped down the nearby path, maybe a mounted police patrol. I was sure they'd love to find two kids hanging out in the park at one in the morning. It's no good, Nico said at last. But I had a feeling. My empathy link was really tingling for the first time in months, which either meant a whole lot of people had suddenly switched onto the Nature Channel or Grover was close. I shut my eyes and concentrated. Grover! I knew he was somewhere in the park. Why couldn't I sense his emotions? All I got was a faint hum at the base of my skull. Grover, I thought more insistently. Hmm, hmm, something said. An image came into my head. I saw a giant elm tree deep in the woods, well off the main paths. Gnarled roots laced the ground, making a kind of bed. Lying in its arms, crossed, and his eyes closed, was a satyr. At first, I couldn't be sure it was Grover. He was covered in twigs and leaves like he'd been sleeping there a long time. The roots seemed to be shaping themselves around him, slowly pulling him into the earth. Grover, I said. Wake up. Dude, you're covered in dirt. Wake up. Sleepy, his mind murmured. Food, I suggested. Pancakes. His eyes shot open. A blur of thoughts filled my head like he was suddenly on fast forward. The image shattered and I almost fell over. What's happened? Nico asked. I got through. He's... yeah, he's on his way. A minute later, the tree next to us shivered. Grover fell out of its branches right on his head. Grover! I yelled. Woof! Miss O'Leary looked up, probably wondering if we were going to play fetch with the satire. <laughs> Grover bleated. You okay, man? Uh, oh, I'm fine. He rubbed his head. His horns had grown so much that they poked an inch above his curly hair. I was at the other end of the park. The dryads had this great idea of passing me through the trees to get me here. They don't understand height very well. He grinned and got to his feet. Well, his hooves, actually. Since last summer, Grover had stopped trying to disguise himself as human. He never wore a cap or fake feet anymore. He didn't even wear jeans since he had furry goat legs from the waist down. 
His t-shirt had a picture from the book where the wild things are. It was all covered with dirt and tree sap. His goatee looked fuller, almost manly, or is that goatly? And he was as tall as me now.